Uh, action research is one of those hot topics. I recently graduated with my EDD from Northeastern and the College of Prof Professional Studies last year. And uh, we were the first cohort to go through uh, the action research and dissertation and practice um, the kind of module, if you will. And so doing that uh, really lent itself to instructional design and what I do. Uh, Chuck, I know that you've mentioned several times that we've been instructional designers for as long as we can remember our whole careers, but it always, <laughs> it hasn't always had a name, right? Uh, it, yeah. So once I found instructional design, I realized I've been doing that my entire career. Uh, <laughs> it's kind of the same as action research. I didn't know that I was an action research researcher, come to find out. I've been doing that for quite some time. So I'm going to just talk a little bit about my project that I did to gain my EDD through Northeastern University and how I apply that at the DeMore McKim School of Business at Northeastern University. All right. Uh, so some introduction uh, to to me and our group. Uh, we sit within the office of the Dunton Family Dean at the DeMore McKim School of Business. I report to the Senior Associate Dean of Faculty and Research. And so we sit on the academic side, uh, faculty facing and uh, I, as you mentioned, Denise, in the introduction, I manage and direct the instructional design group. We are a decentralized group from the university, uh, DeMore McKim specific, and our goal is to empower our stakeholders to discover, design, and deliver learning, high quality learning experiences, uh, whether those are for credit, not for credit, uh, staff focused, faculty focused, whatever those learning experiences are. Uh, our organization within the group, I'm the director of instructional design and technology. I'm lucky enough to have a learning experience designer and LXD in Gabby Baca and a faculty training and development associate in Barbara Barsh. And so that's kind of our organization um, within the IDG at DeMore McKim. Not all colleges at Northeastern have a dedicated instructional design group. We are one of the few dedicated resources uh, that are decentralized from uh, the university services and support. Uh, and so just to briefly talk about uh, action research, action research is uh, cyclical qualitative research. It's mostly focused on uh, Ernest Stringer's uh, 2014 work, Action Research, and it's seeking out specific and effective solutions that bring about unique and uh, again, specific change within an institution. And so uh, as a change agent and a scholar, practitioner, I found that it was difficult for me to just be a, a fly on the wall and observe from a distance what was going on. I kind of like to dive in deep, get my hands dirty, and action research proved to be a methodology, a methodology that allowed me uh, to do that. So uh, I was lucky enough to be in the first co cohort at CPS that did this action research DIP uh, model. And uh, Something that scared me about action research at first was the pace of change. I'm so lucky that um, my dissertation chair, Dr. Joseph McNabb, uh, got me early on. And I, you know, I, I remember meeting with him several times and saying, gosh, things are happening so fast. And he, he would say, calm down, Jacob. That's, that's what's supposed to happen. Uh, they, things are supposed to happen fast because uh, in action research, we did three cycles. So a cycle zero, then a cycle one, and then a cycle two. Well, you really don't do your evaluation of your action steps until your cycle two. But in my cycle zero, in cycle one, I was getting faculty so amped up about the change that we were having that it already kind of started to snowball on me and I didn't really know what to do. Uh, and again, so action research proved to be the best method uh, of approach that we, we were going for and what we do at the IDG. And now we, we do a lot of action research uh, as well. So I was thankful to have the foundation laid uh, at CPS. So again, with action research, your positionality, you don't ignore your bias. You actually kind of lean into it. And so being a person that leverages technology to solve problems, I didn't want to try to ignore that or try to push that to the side. I really want to lean into that. And so being open and honest about my position towards technology uh, was really helpful. Uh, so 
the problem of practice, what I was noticing was that faculty were not using digital formative assessments in their courses or that they were struggling in using digital formative assessments in their courses. And so understanding those faculty barriers that faculty were experiencing uh, to fully understand what was going on, what was keeping, keeping them, what was the disconnect, and then how could our group help solve those problems. And so we gathered up some participants. We had uh, 13 participants, faculty participants across traditional, hybrid, and online courses, uh, and also inclusive across all academic departments at the DeMore McKim School of Business, and as well as uh, full-time faculty, tenured faculty, full-time faculty, non-tenured teaching track faculty, and part-time faculty. Uh, my group is presenting uh, coming up in May uh, about this model that we're being more inclusive, especially with part-time faculty, because they make up a significant part of our support and services and a significant part of our value as an institution. And so I wanted to make sure that my research was inclusive uh, to both full-time and part-time faculty. And I'll explain more about that in a minute. But uh, cycle zero, I kind of will set the foundation for my action research. And I kind of went in thinking like, if faculty just, just don't want to. They don't want to do digital formative assessments. This is, you know, I started the program in 2018. Uh, the, you know, so pre-pandemic, pre they just don't want to for whatever reason. <laughs> uh, and that was not the case. Like when I went and, and did the foundational uh, cycle, I realized that faculty had tried and, I mean, using their words, failed. They, there was something that had you know, stepped in the way from them being able to do it successfully. And so it was really important. It changed my view having that first cycle in meetings with faculty. It changed my view on how I was going into it, thinking that they just didn't want to do it. They wanted to do it and just didn't know how or uh, tried something that didn't work out and were scared to do something else or uh, fear of doing something wrong. And, and so understanding what those barriers were that were keeping faculty away um, was kind of the focus of my research. And so you see there in cycle one, I uncovered barriers like the fear or, or risk of using digital formative assessments. I guess I, I should explain, I, though my focus was on digital formative assessments, this could be applied across operationally across. It did, doesn't have to be specific to digital formative assessments. But what I mean by that is these low stakes assessments that are online uh, to help build on students' learning as they go through the course before some high stakes summative uh, assessment. So just to define that, but my focus here today won't be on digital formative assessments. Just know that that's what I was researching at the time. And uh, so those barriers, I mean, I think they, some were specific to us at Demore McKim, but probably applicable at other institutions fear or risk of using digital formative assessments, a lot of self-efficacy concerns, faculty concerned with their own skills in using the technology effectively, time and availability. Some faculty didn't have the time to devote to building out these assessments or uh, the time to come to our trainings to learn how. Lack of awareness. A lot of faculty cited that they were just simply unaware of what was out there and what they could be doing. Uh, perceived value of tools, as well as just like a lack of incentive uh, for for doing digital formative assessments, and that was mostly in like the traditional courses. You know, there's a lot of incentive to do in online and hybrid, but in our traditional courses, there was kind of a lack of incentive there. Faculty provided some recommendations in that first cycle on what we could do to overcome that, and I put some of those recommendations into play as my action step on the next slide. Okay, so uh, what I did was I kind of created a giant action step. I probably didn't have to bite <laughs> off as big of a chunk as I did. Uh, I probably could have just taken one of these uh, and, and did it, but I, they, it really just felt like at the time they fit together nicely. And so what I opted was my, my giant action step was really five mini action steps uh, in that Oh, so we created an operational model for faculty development, instructional design services, and academic technology support, specifically uh, paired or created 
based on faculty recommendations. It was solely based on faculty recommendations, this model, and our hope was and is now that it could be applied to other things besides digital formative assessments. And so what faculty recommended, they re recommended faculty showcase events. They said that, hey, like, I, we know that there's some cool stuff happening here at DeMore McKim. Uh, we've seen stuff at other universities and what they do, but we really want something with within the business context and also like within the DeMore McKim context. I think it, it, it was meaningful for faculty to see their peers uh, doing these things and doing them successfully. And so they, they offered up that recommendation, asynchronous onboarding course uh, for especially for new faculty, part time faculty, they recommended uh, having something that they could go through that uh, on their own time uh, that would teach them about uh, digital formative assessments, our communication strategy to, to address that awareness barrier, right? Uh, is that for whatever reason, faculty were, we send plenty of emails. We, you know, do plenty of things to communicate with faculty, but why were they unaware of what we were doing? You know, why, uh, were they unfamiliar with the tools, uh, and everything that was out there, uh, revamping our instructional design strategy, uh, which included hiring, specifically in LXD, as I had previously mentioned, hiring a designer on staff. Uh, we did not have a designer when I started uh, in this group. I was an academic instructional technologist and fac faculty developer, teacher by trade. I was not uh, a trained learning experience designer. And so hiring someone uh, that was, and also for uh, learning design assistance. We have four part-time employees that assist in building out digital formative assessments. And so faculty um, it requested that we have someone to build. I think in our space, a lot of people think, okay, we should be teaching faculty how to do this, uh, but our, how to build digital formative assessments and all about instructional design. But in reality, uh, the faculty that we work with really fit into three different buckets. Some faculty want to learn everything that we're doing. They want the training. They want to do it themselves. And that's great. You know, that was the audience that we were really servicing before, but we have other faculty that want it to be a collaboration and they really want our expertise and want our insight on everything that they do. And that's great as well. And then we have a lot of people who say, you know, if, if I didn't have you build it, I just wouldn't do it. And so do we want to, you know, you discount that population of faculty? And, and so my thought is that we should be whatever our customers are coming to us with, um, how can we best fit their needs? And so that if there are faculty that just don't have the time and the availability, we want to be able to build it for them. So it, those three buckets, we service all of them. So instead of putting all of our efforts in trying teaching faculty how to do it, uh, we focus on the audience that wants that type of learning. And then we also focus on the audience that wants um, us to build it all for them. We take their ideas and make it a reality. And then uh, lastly, academic technology support strategy. We revamped that to again, hire a faculty training and development associate. I'm a faculty developer and teacher, but the amount of requests that we were getting, especially when COVID hit, the amount of requests that we were getting was, I mean, we're talking thousands of percent increased. Uh, it, it was just incredible. And we did not have enough support and and we offer custom support for demore mckim faculty and staff uh so that it's someone they know they know barbara she's amazing as a just like they know gabby as a as a designer having someone you know and a friendly face that you can talk to and know someone that is going to help you regardless of the situation you're in within the specific business context that makes Demore McKim such an awesome place, uh, I think is extremely helpful. So all five of those were faculty driven recommendations that I gathered in that cycle one. And so what faculty did in cycle two was they engaged with each one of those action steps. So they watched the faculty showcase event or attended live. They went through and completed the onboarding course. They engaged with our uh, new emails and with our new website, with our uh, new Microsoft Teams communication. They 
connected with Gabby and built some sort of digital formative assessment or had something built already and opted to kind of touch it up. Uh, and then the academic technology support strategy, they met with uh, Barb on a regular basis. Most of them did. And um, and by the way, Gabby and Barb were left out of the research. They had no idea who my uh, faculty participants were or anything like that. So it was fun kind of uh, letting them in on the stats when we when we finished. So they still don't know. And it'll be fun doing more research with them uh, now that I finished my student uh, research. But so I had I again thought that because uh, in action research, you're looking for those thick, rich descriptions. Uh, you're not looking for a survey. You're looking to really connect with those faculty. These are faculty that have worked with us. And so instead of doing um, a survey or anything like that, I opted to do semi-structured interviews. I thought that I could just do one interview, uh, and but again, I bit off more than I could chew uh, and decided to do five mini interviews and that I would get better data. And that proved invaluable because I, I think faculty weren't burnt out by the time in the research. Uh, so instead of having one hour long interview, I had like five, 10 to 15 minute uh, interviews. And I think that proved uh, invaluable to my research. And then analytic memoing, going back to just capturing everything uh, with the pace of change, uh, the, the quick nature of action, just talking about action research and talking about what we're doing and how that's starting everything, analytic memoing was very important as well. And I had an anticipation uh, that there would be new barriers, uh, especially that this cycle two was happening uh, post COVID-19, that the barriers that faculty were experiencing may be different than pre-COVID-19. And so I'll tell you about my results. Uh, so my findings were that all five, all five of these changes that I made within the, the giant action step proved 100% effective in reducing or eliminating barriers. So that means every single faculty uh, across all, all five findings found that these were effective in reducing or eliminating barriers. And so uh, that was the goal. And so they proved successful. Uh, first off, the showcase events provided insight and inspiration for faculty. Uh, one faculty quote here is that they just felt more comfortable using digital formative assessments, uh, seeing that, you know, hey, if, if my buddy can do it, I can do it, you know, uh, and so that proved very valuable to them. The onboarding course spectacularly filled the faculty learning gap. Uh, so a new barrier that I uncovered post uh, COVID was information overload. Faculty said they're getting information, technology information, just hammered with it left and right, and that the onboarding course uh, could provide a curated look uh, at the technology that the IDG felt like was important for faculty to know and understand. And so we had faculty that weren't even new faculty that wanted to be a part of the onboarding course to kind of go through and see that curated look um, at at. Uh, educational technology. The communication strategy uh, successfully combated barriers. Faculty said that they'd be more likely to use digital formative assessments. Having seen our new emails, uh, we started using Eventbrite and MailChimp to really target our emails. We are uh, BFFs with our communications department. And I, I know that y'all have met Isabella and she's a part of a, a wonderful team. And uh, they really helped us get all of our materials on brand to make sure that what we're sending out looks official because it is official. You know, it's coming from the dean's office and I, it, faculty <laughs> thought that that was very valuable uh, as well. And so uh, I should also say that we did a lot of the onboarding course and the showcase events. We did that through Canvas. Canvas is our LMS at Northeastern. And so that behind the scenes kind of addressed the self-efficacy uh, because faculty were actually engaging in Canvas as they went through like it was a Canvas course. So we designed it similar to how we would an online asynchronous course. And so faculty uh, picked up on some self-efficacy just going through and uh, that was neat. And uh, by the way, 90% of faculty prefer to sign up for our events through email. And so that was valuable information to find out and to know that our emails really pop and stand out and know that it's coming from us uh, was great. 
the instructional design strategy improved faculty confidence. I had one faculty that said, uh, I get to use the best tools without all the technical know-how because we, uh, again, go above and beyond to build those assessments for them instead of them having to rely uh, on building it themselves or, you know, um, like textbook tools or those sorts of things that they have a custom built uh, assessment just from us. And uh, it, I have one faculty that said, I just flat out would not have done it if, it, if the IDG didn't do it for me. And so, but um, other faculty said that it improved their confidence having us go through and do it the first time they wanted to learn how to do it uh, after seeing it done. So it improved their confidence along the way. And that the academic technology support strategy increased our accessibility and um, so they, they knew who to go to and when to go to for what. So with this new uh, strategy, having Barbara on board as our faculty training and development associate, you know, they have a certain issue with Canvas. They want to do something cool in Canvas. They want to learn this new tool. They know to go to Barb. She's a person. She's going to answer them back. She's going to schedule a meeting with them. Uh, Barb even created a new uh, scheduling system where they can just schedule a meeting with her uh, on the fly. She always has hours available. So faculty thought all of these changes were great in removing the barriers. So some significance of action research in instructional design, that's kind of my project that I did specifically at DeMore McKim, but it impacts future strategic planning. I know for us, we're including action research in our uh, strategic planning going forward in the next few years. And how I always like to have evidence-based decision-making uh, is is <laughs> something as a leader. I, I think I, I, it, we shouldn't just be doing it because I want to, right? We should be making changes. Uh, one, because our customer, our faculty and our students are uh, requesting them or the research shows that it's it's better. And so action research is a good way to apply less generally and more specifically, like at your institution. This is specifically what's going on. Yes, we still read all the articles out there and do all of that, right? But uh, that may they may not provide solutions to us specifically at Tamar McKim. Uh, we want to expand our findings and our models to be inclusive of more stakeholders. I love doing panels. Again, like being more inclusive right now, we're uh, focusing our efforts really with part-time faculty, but including students. I did not work with students in this research. And you know, ultimately, that's who we're doing this for, right? Uh, the, though the faculty and the staff are our customers, you know, the students are their customers and that they're the end goal and why we're doing this. And so we relied heavily on faculty to be honest and tell us the reactions that they were getting from students and, um, you know, the positive reports that they were getting in evaluations on this stuff. But I do want to be more purposeful in including stakeholders like students in the future. Uh, we revamped our learning analytics. A lot of people think that learning analytics have to be specifically course based, uh, but no faculty development, you know, staff development, you can have a tremendous amount of learning analytics at, at your fingertips. Uh, that don't include students. You know, it's how how faculty and staff are learning, and um, and so we've really kind of dived into our uh, communication and support requests and tracking those, so we have a better understanding of who our customers are. You know, we're ninety percent faculty support, ten percent staff support. Uh, we're you know thirty thirty to forty percent tenured track, you know, 30 to 40% non-tenured teaching track and, you know, about 20% part-time. And uh, so understanding like the learning analytics that we can pull from our audiences is important. I hope that uh, this could, my project could be a blueprint for other design and technology groups, though that's like, that's not the goal really. Like the goal was to understand the specific uh, problems that we were having, but I'm hoping that this is transferable. And I think that it is based on the fact that we're going to be able to transfer across operations uh, with the IDG. And I would, I would not say all of this without also saying the increased activity, the hundreds and the thousands of percent increase that we saw at the IDG in our services and support were not due to my research. Uh, it was the COVID-19 pandemic uh, obviously launched everyone. We, we moved to high flex really fast. And uh, so we went from about 40% of the faculty were meeting with us regularly uh, to 100%, literally overnight. And 
Uh, so the increased activity that we saw, not all due to action research, but uh, we have new customers that are never going away. And then uh, last but not least, the dissemination. I just want to give a, a shout out here of um, the information age publishing is uh, I'm writing a chapter of a book to that details my action research project. Several of us are that are in the cohort. It's called Contemporary Perspectives Through Action Research Across Educational Disciplines and it's specifically uh, higher education. And so there's several of us that are getting together and uh, writing chapters uh, of what we did uh, in these action research projects step by step through the cycles. And that's edited all by Northeastern faculty, Dr. Sarah Yule, Dr. Uh, Joan Giblin, and Dr. Joseph McMahon, who was my uh, dissertation chair. So thanks so much. Wow. That was our fantastic, <laughs> wow. fantastic presentation. Uh,